Well, this is the session that I am possibly the most excited about. We are talking about how to look and live practical Christianity, true faith. And this is one I want to be on my knees before the Lord again. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, we ask that you would enlighten our eyes, open our ears, and give our hearts exactly what we need to hear today. Give us guidance. Show us the path of life, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. This statement right here on the screen is from the book, Testimonies on Sexual Behavior. We introduced this book in the last session, and it says the following. The purity, the holiness of the life of Jesus as presented from the Word of God possess more power to reform and transform the character than do all the efforts put forth in picturing the sins and crimes of men and the sure results. So we've spent some time in this seminar looking at the effects of pornography, looking at the effects of self-abuse, and I'll tell you something, looking at all these effects does very little to give us hope and the solution. It's only the first step to recognizing we have a problem. It is an important step, but let's read on. Not just the life of Jesus presented from the Word of God, but one steadfast look to the Savior, uplifted on the cross, will do more to purify the mind and heart from every defilement than will all the scientific explanations by the ablest tongue. I'll tell you, there have been addiction recovery talks from a secular point of view that focus very much on, on behavior modification and these other things that are not as spiritually tied. And if we don't have this session, the whole thing falls apart. If we don't have this as the focus, the whole thing falls apart. But then, you know, a lot of people will say, come on, your religion stuff, you really have a whole session on this stuff. It, it, it's, it's really working for people. Amazingly, yes, what you're going to find is it, it, regardless of the caricature of Christianity and Christians that you may have, what, what, what the studies are showing is very encouraging with regards to religion. Yes, a lot of, a lot of Christians may be, may be jerks and hypocrites in these things, but not all of them. Religion is working. We read in the following, spiritual well-being is at the center of a healthy lifestyle. This is the American Journal of Critical Care from a research standpoint, a peer-reviewed journal saying spiritual well-being is important. Individuals who personalize their religion, cultivate faith in God, and internalize spiritual values have better coping skills and less depression amidst life's challenges. So if you want to have better coping skills and less depression among life's challenges, like the challenge we're facing right now, then you want to have a very serious and practical faith in your life. Not just that, but in the studies, having a deeply personal religion is strongly associated with life satisfaction. A number of studies have shown that there is a causal link, or a rather an inverse relationship between prayer, the amount of prayer you have, and the propensity and likelihood to have an addiction. So basically, more prayer, less risk of addiction. Less prayer, more risk of addiction. This is scientifically validated stuff. The National Institute of Healthcare Research reviewed 200 studies on spirituality and health. And what they found was that the positive effects of religion outweigh the negative ones 10 to 1. Now, right now, somebody's going, what ne negative effects? I'm a Christian, a Bible-believing Christian. What do you mean negative effects? There are no negative effects for true religion, the true religion of Jesus Christ. But many people practice false religion, so there are going to be negative effects. But even in the midst of all that deception and all that falseness out there, the positive is still outweighing the negative 10 to 1 when they look at the measurable effects. What kind of measurable effects? Well, New Directions in Psychological Science looked at 15 health indicators, and they found that those who were active in their religious faith were better in 100% of these health indicators. Did you hear that? 100%, you don't find 100% in hardly anything in research, but 100% of these health indicators were higher in people that were of a religious faith, especially if you're of a religious faith that emphasizes physical health and well-being. There was an atheist, <coughs> excuse me, an atheist named Robert Sapolsky, and he wrote a book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. In this book, he was very honest in his assessment. He said, if somebody believes in a God who answers prayer, has discernible rules and isn't out to get you, then the stress-reducing advantage must be extraordinary. So from an atheistic standpoint, they can say, yes, if you have a certain picture of God, then you will, you will have a, a lot less stress. How much more for us who really believe in this God and know this God on a personal level? You know, I think we've really misunderstood 
what salvation is. Salvation is not just some theory in the sky. It's very practical. It's very neurological. It reduces stress and depression and these measurable scientific things. I get into, in, in disc, disc one and disc six of Media on the Brain, I get into this issue of what salvation is in great depth. So I won't recover all that same territory, but basically salvation is a lot more than just getting your sins forgiven. It's God reclaiming you from sin. As we said in the last session, Jesus came to save us from from our sins, not in our sins. The Bible says, heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. Heal my soul, not just forgive my sins, but heal my very soul. I will heal their backsliding, God says in Hosea 14, verse 4. Now, you know, like the forgiveness text in the Bible, the most famous text about forgiveness, 1 John 1, 9. What does it say? If you look at it, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And that's an important step. But much of Christianity stops there. Let's read the rest of the verse. And to cleanse who? Us, not just the record of our sins in heaven. He's not just giving us a legal pardon. That's true, but also cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleansing us, giving us a new mind. How is this accomplished? A lot of people picture this as, you know, Christ went to the cross, sacrificed himself for our sins, and and so that he would purchase our pardon and we could be forgiven and we can be made right with God on that legal sense with this transaction of forgiveness. And sure, Christ accomplished that on the cross, but all of the rest, sanctification, is going to have to be my work, not True. Not only did Jesus die on the cross for the forgiveness and pardon of God, but also for the cleansing of us. You're going to see that as we move forward. This is a powerful biblical truth because he overcame. Hey folks, if you're enjoying the program, open up another tab and head over to beltoftruth.tv. You'll see all of our other seminars and topics there from parenting seminars, breaking free from the social control of the power elite through the worldly media and schooling agendas, American history, the history of the pilgrims, history of abortion, overcoming media addictions, bunch of practical topics. And those who believe in our message and want to support the work we are doing, please consider subscribing there. It's free for the asking for those who can't afford the $7 a month, but subscribe at beltoftruth.tv for all of our content. He faced what we face and overcame. He took on our nature. Let's look at this in the Bible. Hebrews 2 verse 14 says... Inasmuch then, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, meaning us, he, capital H, himself, likewise shared in the same, the same flesh and blood. Jesus had the same flesh and blood, the human nature. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, one type, one flesh. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them what? Interestingly, he calls us brethren because he is of the human race. Jesus Christ took on our nature. He is one in the same type of flesh as the children of men are. And so he took on that nature and faced some things. Let's see what he faced. In Hebrews 4.15, he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He was in all points tempted as who? As we are. Reading on, it says in chapter 2, again, Therefore, in all things, in how many things? In all things, even including the things we're talking about now, he had to be made like his brethren, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. So Jesus literally, in his human, he never lost his divine nature. He is fully God, but he did become fully human and faced what we face as we face it in terms of the sexual temptations that are around us. And not just that, he not only was tempted, he not only had that nature, but he, he, he overcame on the cross. He faced the ultimate temptation. What is the ultimate temptation? Is overcoming those self-preservation, hardwired, hippocampal drives, right? Save yourself, they said to him while he was on the cross. If you are the Christ, come down from the cross, then we'll believe in you. He saved others. He can't save himself, they said. And so he was faced on the cross with the two principles that are at war in the universe, self-sacrificing love and selfishness, self-preservation. These came head to head. And what happened? In the person of Christ, he chose 
victory. He chose selflessness and love and he sacrificed himself. He did not save self as they were tempting him to do. It was the same thing in the garden, uh, the, the wilderness rather, when he was tempted by the devil. And the devil came to him and said, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone. He fasted for 40 days, gaining victory over the flesh and the lusts and the desires of the human nature and those survival impulses. He was willing to die. He, he, he did not save his own life so much as to shrink from death, just like those in the last days, as we saw in an earlier session in Revelation 12. We're going to have the same experience. And, you know, in, in, in Hebrews 2, if you read in verse 10, it says that he was made perfect through suffering. Now, the first time I read that, I was puzzled. I was, well, Jesus was, was born perfect. He never sinned. He never, he never engaged in, he, he had a, a, a divine nature. He never engaged in any sin. And that's true. He never did engage in any sin. But as a baby, had he accomplished all the victories over our nature that he was to accomplish already as a baby? You know, he, he could have just been killed by Herod, right? And then, then he, sacrificed for, he was sacrificed for our sins and we could all be saved. No, he needed to live the life that we live and face that battle. And through doing that, through the suffering, it says in Hebrews 10, verse, Hebrews 2 rather, verse 10, it says, he was made perfect through that process. And that doesn't mean that he was fallen or, or in error before that. He, at every step of the journey, he made the choice of holiness, righteousness, and obedience to God's law. He lived a perfect life. But he was made perfect through suffering, meaning he developed this mature character to the point where he could be faced with save yourself or die. And he was willing to die. Now that victory is an incredible victory. And it's ours. In John 16, verse 14, it tells us that the Holy Spirit will take that which is Christ's and make it known to us. He will take that which is mine and make it known to you, Jesus said. So the Holy Spirit will take what Christ accomplished and make it known to us. Make it, give it to us. Let us not only hear about it, but experience it. Now that's an incredible truth. And we, so we read in Hebrews 2 again that through death, he actually destroys the devil, destroys him who had the power of death, that is the devil. So the devil cannot have any sort of stranglehold on our lives anymore because when I am in Christ, I am a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. I have the mind of Christ, Christ in me. He has overcome in all points, just as we were. He was tempted and he overcame. And he, has, he will take that which is, the spirit will take that which is his and make it known to us. And now we can say he has overcome death. He has overcome the devil, him who had the power of death. I love this commentary in The Desire of Ages. This is probably the most widely read book and commentary on the life of Christ. The spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent. And without this, without the spirit regenerating us, the sacrifice of Christ would have been no avail. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead. It is the spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's redeemer. It is by the spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Partaker of the divine nature. We'll come back to that phrase later. Christ has given his spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress his own character upon his church. The Greek word in the Bible for salvation, sozo, S-O-Z-O, is the same word used for healing. This is the process. Christ overcame at all points. He developed this perfect, mature human character, not only sacrificed for our sins on a forgiveness level, but also on a reclaiming us from sin level. What a beautiful truth. What the, what the, the, the magnificence of the cross. We haven't even scratched the surface of what the meaning. And we're going, it's going to be the science and the song of the redeemed for eternity in heaven, I believe. And so overcoming... The overcoming problem issue is more than just modifying my behavior like modern psychology teaches. Christ teaches that evil proceeds from the human heart. We were born with this condition and we've developed it over time and we've made bad choices. And so he now comes to us and says, be converted. You need a new heart, a complete conversion. Now, what does conversion mean? To be converted means to be turned around to a complete reorientation on how I live and what motivates my heart. 
Right now, I am born with a sinful nature, selfishness, right? Self is my orientation, if we will. I'm turned in on selfish desires or my own fears or whatever. Conversion is where I focus on God and others. Love God, love your neighbor, and that's the whole meaning of my life. To glorify him, to win souls for him, to bless and uplift humanity. True conversion happens when self is no longer the center and the motives are toward God and toward others. And if you think about it, when it comes to pornography. If you're indulging in pornography, self is obviously the center of this, right? And the moment you start thinking about that person, their humanity, pornography starts to be distasteful, right? You start to say, no, no, this is, this is wrong. Like, if you care about, you can't simultaneously care about that person's well-being, their soul, their eternal salvation, and enjoy it. Pornography becomes unenjoyable the moment you care about them in a true sense. And if you doubt that, think about somebody you truly care about. Think about a family member. And if you were to come across them on a, on a, on a pornography webpage, and you'd be shocked and horrified and, and, and indignant. You'd say, what is going on? How could they do these things to her? How could she be in this situation? Well, all of these women are, are somebody's mother and sister and daughter. And so viewing them, it's God's daughter, how about that? Viewing it through the eyes of Christ. And so pornography will become actually unenjoyable at that point if we have the mind of Christ in our mind at that moment when we care about this person. But as long as we're engaging in the pornography, we're not in that converted state and we're we're, we're self-centered. What is our sexual orientation at that point? Self is our sexual orientation instead of being oriented toward God and others. The Bible says, for by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Let's just get that clear. This is a gift from God. God has even dealt to each one a measure of faith. And God has even given repentance to Israel. Given repentance, dealt us a measure of faith. Many times we think, you know, I understand that God's grace to me, God's gifts of salvation to me are are, are, are a free gift. But I have to somehow muster up within myself enough faith, enough repentance to go to God. That's something, that's what I offer him. That's my part of the equation. And without my efforts of of, of creating my own faith and, and repentance, Well, I can't have God's forgiveness. That's not true. The Bible says, and you just read it, he deals to us a measure of faith. He's the one that enables us to have faith. He grants repentance unto us. So if you're having a hard time repenting, and if you're having a hard time exercising faith and trust in God, he will give it to you. He gives us the ability. Now, we do have to engage in the, we have to engage the will, right? You don't just sit there passively like, God, please take over my mind and, and, and make me a, a, a robot here. But he doesn't require us to take the few steps toward him. No, I'm dead in my sin and transgression. I need the power of God in my life even to repent and have faith. So the power is all of God. The gift is all of God. The enabling is all of God. The righteousness is all of God. And the glory is all to God. But the responsibility is with me. Do I take that step of faith? God doesn't do for us what he has empowered us to do. The responsibility is to us to engage the will to repent, to look to him in faith, even though we have no strength in ourselves to do that. He gives us that, that we seek that we may find, that we knock, that the door might be open and that we abide in him. The the Bible gives us many injunctions, many statements about this is your will that you must engage. You must take this act and that is how you open the heart to receive the free gift. So everything regarding our salvation really depends upon our own course of action. God has done his part. Provision has been made completely. And now he says, what will you do? I'm not going to be saved in doing nothing. It's only through his strength and his his power, but I must step forward and receive the gift. But, you know, many people struggle even to do that because they say, no way. When I'm in this place of shame and degradation and guilt, there's no way he could accept me. And so we just live in that, right? I've failed so many times. How could he forgive me again? So we enter into this self-blame, condemnation, this feeling of no self-worth. Brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you, it's while you were sinners that Christ died for you. He came for the sick, not for the healthy. He came to seek and save that which was lost. So when I'm in the condition of beating my breast before the Lord saying, I am a sinner, 
I am not worthy. And I don't even look up to heaven. Remember the story of the man who says, I'm not worthy before God. And then I look and live. The psalmist says, I cannot even look up. Sometimes I feel like I can't even not look up. Because God, I just feel so, so sinful and so unworthy. You know what? That's actually a good place to be, to know your spiritual poverty. If you are oriented toward God instead of walking into the path of shame, don't stay in self-deprecation. You're on the right track, though, if you're humbling yourself before God, saying, I can't do this. I haven't done it. I've slipped. I've failed. I... There is nothing in me that is good. Even my own righteousness is filthy rags. That's a precondition for salvation to have that attitude. There's an amazing statement from a book called Amazing Grace. This is a 1973 devotional. You read the following. He loved you and gave himself for you. His great heart of love is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Question, did Jesus experience our infirmities? He carried our infirmities and our sorrows. Isaiah 53, right? Reading on. What sins are too great for him to pardon? What soul too dark and oppressed for him to save? He is gracious, not looking for merit in us, but of his own boundless goodness, healing our backslidings and loving us freely while we are yet sinners. He is slow to anger and of great kindness, long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So how then are we to be saved? How do we experience this and exercise this faith in Christ? John 3, 16, of course, is the famous verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And many people with a very shallow view of this have completely misunderstood it. And they say, well, all I have to do is just intellectually acknowledge and assent to the truth that, that Christ is my salvation and that he died on the cross to pay for my sins. So that's my belief. What does James say about belief? He says, even the demons believe and they tremble. And so what kind of belief? By the way, the word for belief in the Greek is the same word for trust and faith. So let's combine this all together. Belief, trust, and faith. What is saving faith? Because we can't just stop with this intellectual concept here. How then are we to be saved? Let's go through the list. First of all, John 12, 32 says that the Son of Man would be lifted up. Jesus on the cross draws everybody unto him. Now, not all will accept it, but all are, are drawn to this and can be drawn to this. He is drawing and wooing everybody. Then we look. John the Baptist said, we behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. So look to Christ crucified. Then upon looking, the light of the cross reveals God's perfect law of love, Christ obeying the law perfectly, his perfect self-sacrifice and character. And, that, and by that law, when I see his, his obedience, when I look into the law of liberty, I am myself am condemned. By the law is the knowledge of sin, the Apostle Paul said in Romans 3.21. And so we are convicted of our own unlikeness to him. Then, simultaneously, his law and his love not only condemn us as sinners, but draw us unto him. And the kindness of God draws us in. And if we don't resist that drawing, Romans 12, 2 verse 4 says that the kindness of God will lead us to, what's that word? Very important word in the process. Repentance. When we repent, we look and live to Christ and we say, just like John said, the book of John, Jesus says, as Moses was lifted up, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And so I exercise faith and trusting in the merits of a crucified Savior, and in so doing, I am justified. Then the next step, it's not just an initial, an initial glance but it's rather a continual looking and living, a continual surrender to bringing every thought to the obedience of Christ. John 15, verse 4, talking about this very same concept. The Holy Spirit then produces new life in the soul. Thoughts and desires are brought into the will of Christ. The heart and the mind are created anew in his image. Last of all, we can finally say, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Psalm 40, verse 8. And then it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Galatians 2, verse 20. Now you heard the crucial steps in there, repentance and faith, and those are needed as part of this. But looking to the cross, we look and live. That's how I'm going to sum up that whole list. Look 
and live. And, and I, sacri I, 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 I sacrifice all my cherished idols. I lay them all on the altar. That's repentance. Repentance, the, the Hebrew word for repentance, teshuva, means literally to turn. I was going in this direction and I turn 180 degrees and I orient myself now towards Christ and I leave the life of sin and I look to him. And that's repentance and exercising faith, trusting that he will work in me to will and act according to his good purpose. If I don't trust him, if I start trying to do it in my own strength, it will fail. There's a parable, a wonderful parable, that helps illustrate how we go forward from this. It's the parable of the leaven and the dough. And there's a commentary on this parable in a book called Christ's Object Lessons. I want you to listen to this statement. It says, none are so vile None have fallen so low as to be beyond the working of this power, the power of God. In all who will submit themselves to the Holy Spirit, a new principle of life is to be implanted. The lost image of God is to be restored in humanity. But man cannot transform himself by the exercise of his will. He possesses no power by which this change can be effected. And so trying harder to overcome our habits is not going to work. If I'm trying just in my own strength to just muscle through this thing and grit my teeth, I'm going to do this. You know what? Who's trying to control the situation? I need to be in control. It's only when I can just let go and let God take control of my life that I can have healing and victory over sin. And I, I'm going to need help. The addict needs help. You can't do it on your own. We have this denial thing of, I can, I can do this. I can, I can make it. Yes, I messed up, but I'm going to move forward on my own. Never, never, never. God says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your what? It's only when we realize we are weak that we are strong in him. The quotation continues. The leaven, something holy from without, must be put into the meal before the desired change can be wrought in it. So the grace of God must be received by the sinner before he can be fitted for the kingdom of glory. All the culture and education which the world can give will fail of making a degraded child of sin into a child of heaven. The renewing energy must come from God. The change can be made only by the Holy Spirit. All who would be saved, high or low, rich or poor, must submit to the working of this power. It continues, no mere external change is sufficient to bring us into harmony with God. There are many who try to reform by correcting this or that bad habit. And they hope in this way to become Christians, but they are beginning in the wrong place. Our first work is with the heart. A profession of faith and the possession of truth in the soul are two different things. The mere knowledge of truth is not enough. We may possess the knowledge of truth, but the tenor of our thoughts may not be changed. The heart must be converted and sanctified. Christ prayed, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Last slide of this quote. The truths of the word of God meet man's great practical necessity. The conversion of the soul through faith. Their vital influence is to be woven into the human experience like the leaven in the dough. They are to permeate all the great things and all the little things of life. Received into the heart, the leaven of truth will regulate the desires, purify the thoughts. It enlarges the capacity for feeling, for loving. The, this love masters every other motive and raises its possessor above the corrupt, corrupting influences of the world. The word of God is to have a sanctifying effect on our association with every member of the human family, including the members we were talking about earlier, being able to look at women through the sanctified eyes of Christ. That's going to require a thorough reformation, a thorough conversion, the leaven working into the dough. You know, many of us have religion as a compartment of our lives, or we include religious truth as a theoretical truth, but we don't let these truths sanctify us. Jesus said, let thy word be truth that sanctifies us. Sanctify them by thy truth, for thy word is truth. And then once I have that experience, then I have practical faith, a practical religion that actually transforms me instead of just some, some theoretical concepts of truth that I believe, which even the be demons believe. The demons know what Bible truth is. They just distort it and deceive. But 
Just knowing it is not going to save me. It's experiencing it that's going to save me. And I believe that one of the greatest deceptions, uh, and not just in the time of Jesus, but in our time today, is that the mere profession of a truth, I just profess to have faith. In fact, in the church I grew up in, it was called profession of faith. That was, and there's nothing wrong with professing our faith. The Apostle Paul says to do it, but is that going to save me? You know, many of us go back to the altar call when I was 14 or the baptism when I was 12 or the profession of faith or whatever it might be. And we say, that's my salvation, right? Way back then. No, no, no. My salvation is today. How am I walking with the Lord today? Do I look and live and experience the fruits of righteousness as I have the dough, the the leaven working through the dough of my soul? And that's what true religion is. We read in Mind, Character and Personality that you love the theory of the truth, but you do not let it sanctify your life. And those who love, those who do not receive a love of the truth in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10 are the ones who perish, right? It says they perish for they, they receive not the love of the truth. In Galatians 5 verse 6, it refers to those whose faith works through love. So do you have a faith that works, a practical faith that is working through love? And this is why we can say that, that, that there is such thing as a dead faith. You know, James says, that faith without works is dead. And so do we have a faith that is truly beholding Christ, truly looking and receiving this experience? Now here's the fundamental question. How do we exercise this living faith, this saving faith? How do we continually look unto Christ and live? Well, we've currently got debased desires as sinful mortals. And so we need a greater desire. We need a, a higher desire. In fact, God already has put eternity in the hearts of men, it says in Ecclesiastes. And so God has implanted within us a desire for holy things, eternal things, heavenly things. Are these desires going to overrule the desires of the flesh? In sessions five and six, you'll see about replacing the bad with good. But that's going to be a key, a key part of the process to the point where we can say, that the lower passions will automatically be overruled by the higher powers of the reason and the conscience. And and, and to get to this point, we we have to guard ourselves. And again, there's more coming on a practical level, but how do you guard about the soul? How do you fence about the soul so that we do not experience these debasing thoughts and, and imaginings and actions? What does it mean to do this? Well, first of all, three things. Number one, we've got to be searching the scriptures diligently. And not just to discover truth theoretically, but to discover God's personal promises to you. Listen to 2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us, listen to what's been given to you, brothers and sisters, exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through what? Through lust. So how do we escape lust? We can partake of the divine nature through the Bible promises, the precious promises. So search the scriptures, look into this deeply, find God's promises to you personally. That's how we guard about the soul from temptation. Because when we have these temptations on our, or when we have these scripture promises on our lips and temptation comes at us, well, guess what we can do? Since God has opened our eyes unto wondrous things in thy law, as the psalmist says in 119, we now have these wondrous things and we can say, we can claim them, right? When the time is needed. And and, and interestingly, to spend the time in the word of God, it requires devotion, right? Devotional time. Do you know what the Latin roots of the word addiction are? The Latin root of the word addiction is to be devoted to. So we need to replace our our devotion to our our, our addiction, to devotions with Christ. And when when he opens things to our eyes every morning, and we're talking about a significant amount of time in the word of God, we will discover these things that will become a practical tool for us because they're personally, we found them. And then we hide them in our heart, step two. I have, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119, verse 111. So how do we not sin? How do we, that I might not sin against you, it's because I've hidden the word in my heart. I've not just discovered these things to make a list and to have a mental exercise. No, this has become a part of me. I'm assimilating these truths into my very nature, hiding them in my heart. And when I've done that, it's not just some theory of the truth. It's a very real thing. And, and then when temptation comes, I found 1 Corinthians 10, 13. 
And in, in, in the context of 1 Corinthians 10, it's talking about the lusts that Israel had, had fallen prey to. And you know what 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says? It says he won't let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But he will always provide a way out. Now, isn't that a wonderful promise? To say, when, when the lusts of the flesh come at me, he will always provide a way out because I've got that in my heart. I have it memorized. You're going to want to member, memorize scripture as a part of this process. So then when you're tempted, you have it right there for you. You can say, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And that's a promise because I'm sub- in submission to God in James 4. You can say that, that he is going to flee and I can say, get behind me, Satan, as Jesus said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And so these promises, it, I'm not going to give you an exhaustive list because you need to do the heavy lifting. You need to go in and search the scriptures because they're for you. God will open your eyes to wondrous things in his law. And that will be a joyful experience. It's not a waste of time. It's not boring. It's a God renewing your mind. And it's a great, great thing. Everybody, everybody. This is, this is not something that the, the preachers and the pastors and the Bible students do. This is for every soul who is oppressed with sin, which is all of us. And we must go through this process. The third step in the process is it's not just intellectually knowing these promises, but it's really learning the lesson of continual communion with Christ. Psalm 25, 15 says that my eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. So if you want to have your feet plucked out of that net of sin and you want to be freed from this thing, then our eyes are, what did it say? Our eyes are ever on the Lord, meaning always. Psalm 16, verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Memorize these things. Remain in me, Jesus says. How do we experience continual communion with him? It's because the Lord is always before me and we are, our eyes are ever unto him. In John 5, interestingly, Jesus said something that fascinated me the first time I read it. He said that he could do nothing on his own. I of myself can do nothing, he said in John 5, 19 and in, in, in verse 30. So even on his own, he could do nothing. How much more than us? I, I can't even look to God on my own. It says in Psalm 40, verse 11, that I cannot even look to God on my own. But it is Christ who has granted to us a measure of faith, right? I can't even breathe without Christ. He is the one in whom I live and move and have my being. And so when, when Jesus said he couldn't do anything on his own, that he could only do it with his father, same thing with us. We can say, though, here's the promise, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the good news. I can do all things. How many things? All things. And then after our, that initial union is formed with Christ each morning and we preserve it through the day with our Bible promises and walking with Christ, we can, pre, we can, we can preserve that. Many people have their morning devotions, but then I do the rest of the day in my own strength. Preserve that union with Christ. That's going to be essential to keep your feet out of the net of the enemy, right? This statement is from Mind, Character, and Personality. As long as life shall last, there is need of guarding the affections and the passions with a firm purpose. There is inward corruption. There are outward temptations. And whenever the work of God shall be advanced, Satan plans so to arrange circumstances that temptation shall come with overpowering force upon the soul. Not one moment can be secure only as we are relying upon God the life hid with Christ in God so unless we are becoming vitally connected with God not just first thing in the morning but all day we are never going to be able to resist self-love self-indulgence sin and temptation you know we may have bad habits that we can leave off for a time but unless we have that moment by moment continual connection with Christ a continual communion with Christ we're going to be at the mercy of the enemy and he will gain victory in the end for when I lose hold of Christ I am in the hands of the enemy at that point but the good news is I am completely secure against the enemy's assaults he has provided every way out that we need when I am in connection with him. He says, I am your shield. I am your very great reward. I am the only defense against evil. And so he will be there. Testimonies on sexual behavior, you read the following. You may not see clearly how you will obtain deliverance from the sins which have been cherished and strengthened with repetition. You might not see how this is going to work, but your deliverance is to be found in Christ and him alone. Now is your time. Now is the golden opportunity. You can walk in purity only by looking and beholding, praying and believing in Jesus. There it is again, moment by moment. 
And Psalm 1 talks about this. It talks about those who can stand in the judgment. It talks about those who have the fruit of righteousness. They are planted like a tree beside streams of water whose leaf does not wither. And whatever they do, do prospers. And you know what's interesting about these people in Psalm 1? It says that they meditate upon the law day and night. All day, thoughts of God are continually coming back to them. When, when the Apostle Paul said, pray without ceasing, does this mean we spend the whole day on our knees before God? No, but it means we, we never break that connection with God through working in our own strength or just filling our minds with a million other things. I told you about the habit of my wife and I to have an hourly prayer time, just in case I went an hour and got stressed out or, or, or whatever. And I forgot God and I didn't have any thinks, thoughts of God for an hour. That would be tragic to go an hour without thinking of my best friend who is with me continually. And so the prayer time continually to have those checkpoints through the day, checking in with God. And Deuteronomy 6 talks about it very clearly. It says, talk of the law of God as you sit down and as you rise up, as you walk along the way. Are our conversations filled with the things of God? In Mind, Character, and Personality, we read, Satan leads man to break the bands which connect him in holy, happy union with his maker. Then, when he is disconnected from God, passion obtains control over reason and impulse over principle, and he becomes sinful in thought and action. His judgment is perverted. His reason seems to be enfeebled. So how do we get to that point where we become overwhelmed with temptation? We aren't able to think properly. It says Satan breaks that connection with God. You know, other than Christ, I can think of somebody in the Bible who did not have that connection broken. Christ, of course, he relied on his father completely. But there was one man, and, and perhaps others, but one that comes to mind especially, that we, you, you might be saying, this is impossible. How can you actually really walk with the Lord all day and have a sense of his presence all the time? Really? Come on. Somebody did it. He walked with God. Do you know who that was? That was Enoch. And he walked with God in such close intimacy that he was just taken right into heaven. I've been studying the life of Enoch lately. I've read an interesting book called Living the Life of Enoch. I want to live the life of Enoch. You know, Enoch is an interesting guy because not only did he walk with the Lord, but he was translated to heaven without seeing death. He proclaimed the judgment and proclaimed the coming of Christ, you read about in the book of Jude. And he lived in, ex in an exceedingly wicked time right before the flood. And he preached during a time right before the wicked world was to be destroyed. Does this sound familiar, brothers and sisters? This is the time which we live in today. The most wicked time in earth's history other than the flood and a time where we are proclaiming the judgment. We are proclaiming the soon coming of Christ. We are seeking to walk with Christ and we will be translated to heaven without seeing death when Christ comes. So in this respect, Enoch is a pattern man. He's a, he's a model. He's a, he's a type of us, if you will. We are the fulfillment of, of his experience. So being a pattern man, I want to study him. I want to study his life and say, you know, how, how did he overcome? Because we're going to overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony in the last days. And so if we don't overcome, we're not living the life of Enoch. And that life is going to be needed for the 144,000 in white robes in Revelation 7. We are to receive the seal of God and overcome by the blood of the lamb. How does the life of Enoch go? Well, let's read a quotation. Living the life of Enoch, page 4 and 7. Distrusting his own strength, Enoch hangs his helpless soul on Jesus and takes hold of the strength of the Most High. Brethren, here's how you live it. Pray at home, in your family, night and morning. Pray earnestly in your closet. Pray while engaged in daily labor. Lift up the soul to God in prayer. It was thus that Enoch walked with God. He spent much of his time in solitude, which he devoted to reflection and prayer. He walked before God and prayed to know his will more perfectly that he might perform it. To him, prayer was the breath as the breath of the soul. He lived as in the very atmosphere of heaven. So even in this fallen and toxic world we find ourselves in, with the miasma of sin and degradation all around us and the, the demonic temptations, we can say, I'm going to look to Christ in prayer and live in the atmosphere of heaven. Let's read more. There are a bunch of quotations. The eloquence of silence before God is often essential. If the mind is kept in continual excitement... Well, the ear is prevented from hearing the truth that the Lord would communicate to his believing ones. Now, I know I'm tempted with this to get busy. I, you know, want to want to share the truth and, and, and have a ministry and present other things to people and communicate and set up live speaking events and my children and all of these things. And here we go with the juggling act of life. And we don't have those moments of silence before God. 
That's not going to be the life of Enoch if we live in the fast-paced 21st century go, go, go world. We've got to slow down and listen. God says, I, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. But we don't hear the voice of God because we're just filled with our own thoughts. Another quotation. Many fail of imitating our holy pattern because they study so little the definite features of that character. Are we studying the character of God? If we don't, we will fail of imitating that pattern. Reading on, so many are full of busy plans, always active, and there is no time or place for the precious Jesus to be a close, dear companion. If they did, they would walk with God as Enoch did. If we keep the Lord ever before us, allowing our hearts to go out in thanksgiving and praise to him, we shall have a continual freshness in our religious life. Our prayers will take the form of a conversation with God as we would talk with a friend. He will speak his mysteries to us personally. Often there will come to us a sweet, joyful sense of the presence of Jesus. Often our hearts will burn within us as he draws nigh to commune with us as he did with Enoch. That's the experience I want. The priests and rulers, though, in Jesus' day, they needed just such an experience as Enoch had. They needed a continual sense of the presence of God. Important phrase there. A continual sense of the presence of God. Listen to this. Our experience in divine things will be in proportion to the vividness of our sense of his companionship. In proportion, let's explain that a little bit. The greater our sense of our companionship with him, the greater our sense of his presence, the vividness of, of his presence, the greater our experience in divine things, overcoming sin and so on. The less our sense of God's presence and the vividness of his companionship, the less our experience in divine things. This is so crucial, living the life of Enoch. Let's read another one. But you say... I do not feel like it, meaning I don't feel the presence of God. Tell me, what value is there in feeling? Is feeling stronger than faith, which is your privilege to exercise in God? Feelings change with almost every circumstance, but the promises of the eternal are as solid rock. Let us build our house upon the sure foundation and rivet our souls to the eternal rock, the rock of ages. If we do this, we shall find that it will become habitual for us to remember that we have a companion. Wherever we are, we are to talk with God. This is the way Enoch walked with God. He talked with them. He recognized the divine presence. Now Enoch had intimacy, openness, and attraction. This is amazing. That's exactly what we need to hear in this seminar. Enoch walked with God, but how did he gain this sweet what? Intimacy. It was by having thoughts of God continually before him. As he went out, as he came in, his meditations were upon the goodness, the perfection, and the loveliness of the divine character. Tell Jesus everything. Lay open before him the secrets of your heart. For his eye searches the inmost release. Re Let me say that one again. Tell Jesus everything. Lay open before him the secrets of your heart. For his eye searches the inmost recesses of the soul. And he reads your thoughts as an open book. You see the openness there. Unless the Lord is the center of, what's that word? Attraction. Unless he is a special defense against the temptation of the enemy, Satan will gain power over your mind and separate you from God. One last one on Enoch. He lived in a corrupt age. And when moral pollution was teeming all around him, yet he trained his mind to run in a righteous channel, and he bore the impress of the divine. So, how can I control my thoughts? How do I take every thought captive so that I'm always recognizing the divine presence? How do I have a new habit of mind where I'm seeing that Jesus is my companion, that he is giving me a new thought, a new channel to run in? How do I overcome the lust of the eyes? Just praying for Satan to be bound is not going to be enough. Satan not tempting you deliberately and, 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 and personally or one of his demons is not going to free you completely from the lust of the flesh because we have it within our own nature. A new mind is needed. A new, a new whole new person is needed. And that's why we need sessions five and six to talk about how to have a new creation, how to have a new experience. And we read in Mind, Character, and Personality that the con converting power of God changes the heart, refines and purifies the thoughts 
unless a determined effort is made to keep the thoughts centered on Christ, a determined effort to keep the thoughts centered on Christ, then grace cannot be reve reveal itself in the life. The mind must engage in the spiritual warfare. Every thought must be brought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. All the habits must be brought under God's control. And you'll see the key to this in the last sessions. But as we close, I want to share a quotation from, from Mind, Character, and Personality. It says, The mind must be kept in meditating upon pure and holy subjects. An impure suggestion must be dismissed at once. And pure elevating thoughts, holy contemplation, be entertained thus obtaining more and more knowledge of God by training the mind in the contemplation of heavenly things. God has simple means open to every individual case, sufficient to secure the great end, the salvation of the soul. Now, brothers and sisters, we are caught in a trap of the devil presently. And we might say, well, I've tried to control my thoughts. I've tried to bring it back and contemplate a higher and holier thing. But don't forget the presence of Jesus, that continual walk of faith. If I go a number of minutes without a thought of God and the things of God and the presence of Jesus, then I am opening myself up to temptation. And if you're thinking, you know what? This just seems too hard and I've failed so many times and I feel so much condemnation and shame and guilt. I wanna, I wanna end with this. Jesus is that loving physician looking over you, bending over you, saying, just get back up. Go forward, let's do it again. He's never going to get tired of saying that. He's going to say it again. He's going to keep saying it again and again and again until he grows you up into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He will forgive you. He will say, get back up. Let's move this again. Remember the woman caught in adultery. Remember how Jesus deals with an adulterer. He says, I'm not here to condemn you. Get up and sin no more. That's his message to us today. He's provided every provision for the completion of our Christian character. He has promised it to you and he will fulfill it. He will finish the work in you. That's his promise. Claim that, cling to that. Do not be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. What a friend we have in Jesus. You know the old expression about snitches? Well, in this case, snitches get rewards. We want to thank you for turning folks in and making sure we are all safe. So we've got an epidemic of addiction and suicide brewing here. You saw 25 times more calls to the hotline. Well, is that what we're doing with economic deaths that are coming down the pike with half a billion more people being in poverty because of the economic lockdowns? That means 135 million people on earth are marching toward the brink of starvation. What you really want, and I wrote about this in the Wall Street Journal over the weekend with Lawrence Silvers, is a massive sentinel surveillance system where you can be testing people randomly in the background to detect where the virus might be spreading. And at the moment, in most parts of the world, due to lockdown, most of the transmission that's actually happening in many countries now is happening in the household, at family level. Now we need to go and look in families to find those people who may be sick and remove them and isolate them. He's being taken away by the Brighton police for playing softball with his daughter in an empty park. Being arrested with his mother, you gotta be kidding me. Why? 
We need the wake up call that Jesus is coming soon, that prophecy is being fulfilled. We get so lackadaisical. We get so, ah, uh, you know, I'm just going about my business. And we're coming up on a time in Earth's history that is unprecedented. And it's time to get busy with mission work, with restoring our families, with restoring our relationship with Jesus Christ and getting right where we need to be in our lives, in our spiritual lives. As of Sunday, most businesses like grocery stores will be closed every Sunday for the whole month of April to give employees a chance to rest. And everyone says that's how it should be. It is a very good idea to think about it for the future so that everybody takes a good day Sundays and spend it with the family, which is the family values like we used to have back in the old days, back in the 60s. Shoppers agree that Sunday is a day for everyone to rest, some referring to their childhood in the 60s and 70s when everything was closed. I totally agree because Sundays is the day of the Lord. I grew up with the grocery stores being closed on Sunday, so it's not a bad idea. I think it's a good idea. I think uh, people have to take it a bit more seriously. Pope Francis, in an Easter letter to leaders of social movements, wrote, quote, This may be the time to consider a universal basic wage. Several countries have said they will implement some form of temporary or permanent universal basic income in response to the global pandemic. Fauci trained me at Cornell, and I like Fauci. But Fauci, unfortunately, is a very strong Jesuit follower. In other words, he's more Catholic than the Pope. Where am I with Christ? Where is my spiritual condition? And we take a deep breath. We don't have the, 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 the fear and anxiety response over all this. The Bible says that many people, when they see the prophecies being fulfilled, that their men's hearts are failing them for fear. But we have the privilege to lift up our heads for our redemption draweth nigh. So that's the Christian response to all of this. All of the projection, by, by the way, all the statisticians have been 100% wrong. And we've been following the models because that was the only blueprint, but they haven't turned out to be uh, correct. You can start to see that when we take our cues from public health officials and the talking heads on the media and the agendas of the powerful global elite, we get ourselves in trouble when we don't look at the actual data. It's worse than the flu. It's more potent as a bioweapon of Satan to take human life. We are under directed biological warfare attack. Most of the work we're going to do to be ready for pandemic two, I, I call this pandemic one. Probably we should be debating a bill requiring every American to attend a church of their choice on Sunday to see if we can get back to having a moral rebirth. The restoration of Sunday as a day of rest, a paid day of rest, a required day of rest. Non-essential, interesting word there, huh? We hear that word these days. Non-essential business establishments were required to be closed on Sundays. Brace yourself, folks, with the gospel armor on and know that we are steps away from Revelation 13. In-person services are prohibited. The church said, hey, isn't there an exception for free exercise of religion? And the court said, what First Amendment? What free exercise? clause no worship service allowed now you might say well shouldn't we be more prudent shouldn't we be a little more responsible with uh, our gathering practices during a time of a pandemic of course but the position of the state to come in and outlaw worship services and arrest pastors this is unprecedented how does this virus change this society what do you see changing fundamentally after all this is done everything I think initially, you know, when we get to the other side, you know, I've been calling it America 2.0. It, it is fair to say things won't go back to truly normal until we have a vaccine that we've gotten out to basically the entire world. What does opening up look like? You know, which activities have, like schools, have such benefit and can be done in a way that the risk of transmission is very low? Yeah. And which activities, like mass gatherings, uh, may be, in a certain sense, more optional. And so until you're widely vaccinated, those may not uh, come back uh, at all. So now there's a declaration and a determination from the power elite in terms of who will be deemed essential and who will be deemed not essential. What you want is every single person to get tested every day, and then they would wear a badge. But one of the things that you have to be able to do is to track people 
who are positive. And that's just going to require an army of folks. We need tracing agents in the hundreds and hundreds of people, right? You take the test and then you trace back all the contacts. This is an army of tracers, they're basically investigators. So people are looking for rural real estate like never before and buying seeds. They're getting self-sufficient and then seed companies can't keep up as more Americans turn to growing their own food. Raise our own provisions as you read in the book, Country Living. Read that book. You just read that Michigan residents during the lockdown are prohibited from leaving the cities, from fleeing the cities to go to rural land. They banned the sale of seeds. The state of Michigan made it illegal for you to buy seeds, and not because of a shortage, but because they are non-essential. So growing your food to feed your family is now perceived as non-essential. Yeah. So you're saying I'm not allowed on the front garden? Did everyone hear that? We will not at this stage be starting to marshal supermarkets and checking the items in baskets and trolleys to see whether it's a legitimate, necessary item. But again, be under no illusion. If people do not heed the warnings and the pleas that I'm making today, we will start to do that. God has his people in government and many people who push forward with these measures who are well-intentioned. I'm not trying to be mean to the judge who said, you know, no church services and, and the police officers who shut down the drive-in church and all of that. I'm sure these people all mean well. But at the top, there is a satanic elite with an agenda that has pushed for population reduction, that has pushed for mass murder of the unborn. Just look at my session on beltoftruth.tv called Planned Eugenicide. And there's more police cars at a church service. Yes, this is King James Bible Baptist Church where Pastor Hamilton, where I'm the pastor of the church at. When you get a, a, a order from the government, yeah. your, your right are suspended. No, the government, our right don't come from authority. It comes from the Bible. So the authority does not have the, the right over the, the Constitution. We're talking about the Constitution law. The first, second amendment, the U.S. Constitution that was given to us by our forefathers. Tate Reed can't give it, take it away. Mayor Eric Simmons can't take it away, nor the police officers. It, it can't. Not the military, that's military <laughs> No, it can't. You made that decision, and as I noted before, 15 congregants at a synagogue in New Jersey were arrested and charged for being in a synagogue together. Now, the Bill of Rights, as you well know, protects Americans' right, enshrines their right to practice their religion as they see fit and to congregate together to assemble peacefully. By what authority did you nullify the Bill of Rights in issuing this order? How do you have the power yeah, to we do were, that? That's above my pay grade, Tucker, so I wasn't, uh, I wasn't thinking of the Bill of Rights when we did this. Social distancing is critical. Well, these are the times that try men's souls.